Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you've joined us here today. Hope everyone is well and staying safe. Uh, I'm in the narthex here at First Presbyterian Church in Alexander City. And, uh, you know, really, I've got a confession to make. You know, I'm tired. I'm tired of wearing masks. I'm tired of wearing gloves. I'm tired of not hugging. I'm tired of not shaking hands. I'm tired of keeping six foot distance. But you know, I think we have to trust in the Lord and we may have to get by one day at a time and we may have to just uh, suffer through it for a while, but there will be a day when I won't have to worry about these things and I'll hopefully get back to a, a life that I'm a little bit more comfortable with because uh, I miss my church family. So. So this is my favorite spot. Uh, you know, late in the afternoons, I get to see the sun rise, but I think my favorite time is early in the morning, just before dawn. You, you can't actually see the sun rise from here, but you can see the sky brighten up. It's quiet, it's peaceful. It's, it's, this is where I turn my brain off. Oftentimes I will sit here with my laptop and write music and drink a cup of coffee early in the morning, I seem to be able to get a whole lot more done then. We go to work every day. We come home same time in the evening, uh, come down here most nights and get up in the morning and do it again. Uh, the, I think the biggest uh, difference for both of us is the fact that we can't go to church uh, it really impacts me that I, I'm not doing my choir um, and, and we're not worshiping together. The, the videos are, are great, but uh, I do miss making uh, music uh, with the choir. How long have you lived out here? Whew, we started sharing this cabin with some friends of ours probably 20 years ago. This has been our place for 20 over 20 years and well things are things are gradually improving we'll be back together before too long i hope uh, I, i'm working on ways to to be able to utilize the choir perhaps uh, through a virtual choir or hopefully we can uh, do some small group work like we did not long ago thank you robert god bless you and glory thank you bruce and god bless you Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, let your name be held sacred. Let your kingdom come. Keep giving to us the bread we need day by day. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Do not bring us into temptation. He said, Which of you has a friend 
will go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine arrived at my house on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer in his own thoughts, Stop bothering me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot give up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything, even if he is a friend, he will do it because of his friend's persistence. I tell you, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of his disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Now in seminary, uh, we learned oratorical skills for public prayer to sound dynamic with King James vocabulary and authority. But the disciple did not ask Jesus, teach us how to sound like we are praying. He said, teach us to pray. He wanted instructions about how to pray well. No, what was Jesus doing just before this question came up? He was having personal prayer. 
the disciple was thinking, he has such effective prayers. If I ask him the secret to prayer, he will tell us. There's a modern fad going around among Christians to learn techniques of spiritual practices. Now, they buy books about different new spiritual disciplines. And people go to conferences and, and retreats to practice new techniques uh, with uh, interesting sounding names like shepherding the soul, that's one technique, training the spiritual psyche, another one, fasting and feasting cycles. Meditating on the singing bowl. I was in a group that did that one time. Spiritual breathing. Soul friendship mastery. There's one called little deaths. Little deaths proficiency. Well, this list goes on and on. And when someone comes up with a new one, they write a book and they charge big money to come to their conferences, go to their retreats. The rest of us, we're just stuck with the old time boring spiritual disciplines like repentance and confession, and confronting our failures with remorse, and attending worship and Bible reading and meditation on the 23rd Psalm and solitude with God, keeping the Sabbath, practicing humility submission and obedience, all those old laborious practices from the Bible that they don't do at some mountain retreat. Now prayer can become old hat with us, those of us who've been praying the longest, and we can benefit by going back to the Lord's school on prayer. So we ask Jesus, Show us how to pray. And we listen to him as if we don't know anything. He instructs us here in this passage, in this school of prayer. Now, I found three lessons on prayer in, the, in this passage, and I'll share them with you in coming weeks. But the first one is prayer in God's name. Prayer in God's name. We see that in verse 2. What's the very first word of this prayer that Jesus taught us? Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father. Now, no earthly father is without fault, but most fathers make an effort to love and protect their children. Fortunately, most people think of their fathers with love. We have precious memories. Now that we're adults, we understand dad better. We forgive him his mistakes and his weaknesses. Well, Jesus gave us a word to Christians to use as an address for God. And that word is Father. Because we should think of God as everything that a father ought to be. Loving, protective, wise, doting, affectionate, strong, brave, always there. Everything we hoped our fathers would be. Everything we hoped we would be as fathers. And when, when they were at their very best, our fathers, when they were at their very best as fathers, that's the picture in our hearts, in our minds of God, the good and perfect Father. For Jesus, perfect Father, is a metaphor to frame our picture of God and a word with which to address him. It frames our attitude when we approach, approach God. This God, this unimaginable being about whom there is more mystery than clarity, but cares for us like an unfailing father with unbreakable love. Approaching God as our perfect father gives us at once a sense of intimacy and deep respect Now, in seminary, we were taught to pray with oratorical authority. To sound, if we could, like James Earl Jones. But the disciple did not say, give us diction lessons. 
He said, teach us how to pray. So Jesus said, come to God with language from family life. Now personally, the word Father sustains me in the darkest hours because it leads me to proper, in proper intimacy and proper respect. I know it's only one word, just one word, Father. But one word can make a great difference. You know, in 1631, Baker and Lewis book printers in London, England, printed a King James version of the Bible. But there was a misprint in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments. In that Bible they printed, instead of saying, thou shalt not commit adultery, it said, thou shalt commit adultery. And they called it the Wicked Bible. It was recalled. and. The copies were burned. Only a few of those copies survived. King Charles fined Barker and Lewis $75,000 in our money and took away their license to print books. And today there are seven copies of the Wicked Bible in England, one in New York, one in Houston, Texas, and one 90 miles from here in Gadsden, Alabama. And they sell, by the way, for $100,000. You're going to agree with me that one word in this case, the word not makes a great difference. And I'll tell you in a time of trial and stress, one word, one word can make all the difference. That's when you call up Romans 8.15. I did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but I have received a spirit of adoption and I shall cry out, Abba, Father. In Galatians 4, 6, which tells me that the Spirit leads me to call out to God, saying, Father. I did my doctoral work in Pittsburgh Presbyterian Seminary. It's, um, it's their policy to reject student papers that are handed in if in those papers there's any reference to God as Father or any male pronoun, like a him or, or he. See, they did not want simple compliance with that rule. They wanted us to agree that it's a sin to call God Father. And I told them, well, yes, I'll, I'll say, Holy God, Creator, God of grace, God of glory, but you should know this as you grade my papers. You should know that in my darkest hour, do you hear me? In my darkest hour, I shall not hesitate and I shall not be ashamed to seek intimacy with God by calling him Father. It's only one word, but that word gives me all the support and love that I need.
Thanks again for joining us today. We hope that this service has been a blessing to you. Uh, we also hope that you'll be encouraged throughout this week going forward. Please stay safe. Please talk to your friends. Let's call our family and let's work through this together. The sun will come up tomorrow and uh, this will all be a really great story. Take care. Know that we love you and know that God loves you.